button. Mind you, see if you can, sit on the floor or a couple seats at the table. Sit on the floor. If you're sitting on the floor, sit in the middle, please.
Uh, I'm Abigail Stavinsky. I'm a junior here at Watkinson. I am assigned as Lena's student peer. I'm Rob Gottfried. I'm a motivational educator, Rob the Drummer. Uh, dealing with anti-drug, anti-bullying, anti-suicide, and a pro-arts, pro-sports uh, program, which I actually did here a number of times. Mm -hmm. We loved it. it. Yeah, it was yeah. nice to see the, the, the drum kit. It was, uh, it was huge. It was huge. I, I've been fortunate enough to, I, I've been on Sesame Street and Nickelodeon and MTV and Entertainment Tonight and a bunch of shows. And, uh, I live in West Hartford. Awesome. <laughs> I've been on none of those shows. <laughs> <laughs> but I am pro arts and pro sports. And uh, I'm Chris Cozy. I'm the head of the language department here at Watkinson. And I teach Spanish and I coach both. I'm really excited for this presentation. Okay. I'm just going to read this introductory remarks and then it's on to me. So, senior seminar is a credit bearing required class and serves as a built in structure to prompt, support, and challenge each senior to accomplish meaningful and important work as a capstone to their high school education. The course stresses the importance of strong individual effort, including self-advocacy, resilience, and the value of critical friendship and collaboration. Each student develops primary areas of interest for the senior project, narrows these questions towards a topic, and articulates an essential question. All of this guides them toward their final senior project, which they submitted a few weeks ago. This presentation is designed to exhibit and explicate the student's process and learning over the course of the year. Hello everyone, thank you so much for being here. My name is Nina Grant, and this is my senior exhibition on art and mental illness. Just to give everyone a quick overview of what we'll be talking about, I'm going to start with a brief introduction about how I chose my topic and why I chose it. Then I'm going to deviate a bit from the normal senior seminar order to talk about experiential learning, because as I'll talk about later, my process looked a bit different than the normal process we follow in senior sem. After that, I'll touch on foundational learning and the research I put into my exhibition, then my product and what I did to prepare for today, and finally, a short conclusion. Okay, thank you. So as I just mentioned, my senior exhibition process looked a bit different, and this is why. From September to December, I was researching a completely different topic. My essential question was, what role does communications play in sports management? And while I tell myself all the time that I chose it because I had a genuine interest in the topic, I think I chose it because it was easy. I'm in the Global Studies Diploma Program, and because of that, I had to do two year-long projects this year, and I felt like I had to choose which one to devote my effort to. While those of you who know me know that that doesn't sound like me at all, it was the beginning of senior year, and I wanted to get through it as easily as possible. This quickly became a problem, however, when I got incredibly bored with my topic. <laughs> I had already done what was going to be my product, a media day for our basketball teams, one of the pictures that I'm the most proud of, you can see here, in November, and after that, I didn't have any love left for it. One of the requirements also was that we have peer-reviewed studies, and those were quite scarce in the field I chose to look at. <laughs> So why this direction for the switch? Well, for starters, I really love art. I love going to museums, I write, I sculpt. The piece you see here is something I did last year called Anger. But the project wasn't just going to be on art, there was also a psychological aspect to it. While I wasn't that interested in psychology, I did have a very strong interest in the expression of mental illness. I'm also interested in art history, which is a very big part of this project. The biggest reason, though, was that this wasn't something I was learning about in my other classes, so I knew I wouldn't get as bored with it as I did with my previous topic. For my essential question, I knew I wanted something that didn't have a simple answer. It would take me a while to hack at, but would also keep me interested enough to keep me intrigued for an entire year. I wanted something with a lot of content to sift through, because, as I mentioned, that was one of my biggest problems with my previous essential question. I also wanted something that could teach me new skills. I actually had a conversation with Mr. Kroc about how the best exhibitions are the ones where the presenter learns something new and a new skill to add to their repertoire, and I really took that to heart. Throughout this presentation, I've included different pieces made by artists with mental illness, 
this here being Cafe Terrace at Night by Vincent Van Gogh, who had chronic depression and severe anxiety. Keeping all of this in mind, I landed on the question, what is the relationship between art and insanity? A quick disclaimer, please keep in mind that using the word insane to describe mental illness today is extremely frowned upon, but for the historical accuracy of my project, the artists I'm looking at were called insane in the time periods they were active. I'm keeping it in my essential question. By the time I had switched topics and completed the required assignments, it was already February and time for experiential living. My original plan was to first and foremost find a mentor. Everyone else had a mentor at this point and had planned to be in contact with them over the two weeks. So I felt pretty ostracized and stressed about not having one. <laughs> I also wanted to outline this presentation, just to get ahead in some way, even though I was behind in others. I had planned to start my original product, a research paper, on the link between mental illness and creativity, but overall, I just wanted to catch up to my peers. As you can see, my plan did not go so well. <laughs> Even though I had reached out to four different people, I still had no mentor. I decided to not outline my final presentation because it was something I could be doing later in the semester and focusing on things that I needed to do now. I completely changed my product because I realized I really didn't want to write a research paper, <laughs> but I didn't know to what yet, so I had to start figuring that out. But I did use this time to catch up on research in the University of Hartford Library over the two weeks, and I felt more confident in my base knowledge of my topic. While I didn't get any positive responses from the people I reached out to, or responses at all in some cases, I did use a lot of my time to write emails to these professionals. First, I tried to contact Catherine Quensley, who is the Chair of Art History at Wesleyan University. I thought that she could be useful in pointing me towards specific movements or contacting me with someone that would be more equipped to handle my specific topic. However, she didn't respond. <laughs> After her, I emailed Karen Thornburg, who is a Harvard professor. She teaches a course that covers my topic to a T. So I was so excited when I found her online. <laughs> While she did respond, she said that she was way too busy in her second semester schedule to take on mentorship, which, while was disappointing, I completely understood. I then reached out to Allison Tardif, who is an art therapist. While that wasn't the lens I was taking for my topic, I thought that it could be useful in giving me a new look that I wasn't considering at this time. However, she was also too busy. And finally, I had Mrs. Henzi's help in emailing Roger Beatty, who is a creative psychologist, who said he was too busy to take on mentorship as well. We can see a theme. <laughs> this image here is by a sculptor uh, named Yayoi Kusama, who specializes in polka dots. She has schizophrenia, and one of her pieces is currently featured in the Wadsworth. It, it's really worth checking out. I think it's really cool. Even though not getting positive responses from my potential mentors was a bit disheartening, there were still ups and downs in this entire process. A pro was that I finally got to have a base knowledge of my topic, and I fulfilled my book requirement with The Expressive Instinct by Garija Kemal, a book that talks about creativity and its importance to mental and physical health. Cons, however, were that I felt like I wasted two weeks sitting in a library while my peers were out doing fun things with their mentors. It was also quite boring, but I don't think that would have been the case if I had taken the weeks leading up to it more seriously. But thankfully, right after we got back from the next weeks, I arranged to finally have a mentor. I know you probably have never heard of her or seen her before, ever, but her name is Ms. Birnbach, and she was a lifesaver to my exhibition. Ms. Birnbach is an experienced artist specializing in oil paintings and also had a lot of connections that were useful to me throughout my exhibition process. She was easily accessible, always being open for me to pop in and talk about my exhibition into her office, and was brutally honest about my project, <laughs> something I ended up being thankful for in the long run. <laughs> if I could go back, 
I think I would try to take this stuff a lot more seriously and be more proactive in my work. Even if I didn't have a mentor, I would still try to make the most of my experience. This was a really good wake-up call that I needed to start taking my exhibition a bit more seriously. After I got back from experiential learning, I decided I needed to go back and further my foundational learning, even though I had that base knowledge. I ended up having three main focuses of my research, one being much smaller than the other two. The first and smaller focus was art therapy. Here, I was looking into art being used in therapeutic ways and to rehabilitate mental illness, but also to calm the mind in general and create a sense of peace. For example, the feeling you might get while looking at a calming piece like a Monet. After that, I looked at mentally ill artists, their past, their art, their illness, and how it impacted their life. Finally, I dove into creative psychology, trying to find as much as I could about creativity in the brain. For this, I mostly use podcasts, articles, and journals. The biggest thing I found while researching creative psychology is that there are almost no studies on creative psychology. <laughs> <laughs> because creativity cannot necessarily be stimulated in a research manner, it's very hard to document, leading to little being known about it. There's a very loose definition of creativity within the psychology community, and that is typically the ability to develop original work and ideas. Very broad. Something interesting that I found was that artists tend to have more neural matter in the cerebellum, which is the area of the brain responsible for muscle movement and memory. This is due to the repetition that they put in for hours of honing their work. Certain mental illnesses, like schizophrenia, induce creativity through their positive symptoms, which are symptoms that cause change in behavior, such as hallucinations, which many artists tend to use for inspiration for their pieces. <clears throat> artists with prominent mental illness have been referred to as outsider artists, not to be confused with the outsider artists who are self-taught. <clears throat> Within outsider art, we often see patterns in technique and very repetitive motions. <laughs> Schizophrenia is the most prominent mental illness explored in the artistic community. However, there are many represented throughout. Schizophrenia is the most looked at due to the hallucination phenomenon I mentioned earlier. The image here shows a collection of pieces created by Lewis Wayne, who was a British artist who developed schizophrenia during his art career. Mm -hmm. This gave viewers the unique opportunity to see his art progress and morph with his illness. As you can see, he started focusing on realism and then his art became very pattern-centric and abstract. This quote reads, there is no great genius without a touch of madness, Aristotle. And I wanted to include this in my final presentation because when I came across it, I realized that people have been looking at my topic for a really long time. This made me confused as to why there wasn't more to look at on it. One of the most interesting artists I came across was August Natterer a German artist active from the late 1860s to the early 1930s. Natterer started art when he developed schizophrenia and started to create images based off of his hallucinations of Armageddon and a biblical end to the world. This is his most famous piece called Raw Vision and it is of God destroying his village. This piece is called My Eyes at the Moment of the Apparitions, also by Natterer. Another artist I came across that I really liked and found intriguing was Kim Noble, who was diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder. Formerly known as multiple personality disorder, dissociative identity disorder occurs when the mind splits and forms different personalities due to severe childhood trauma. This is to be able to cope with the trauma and not permanently damage the child in different ways. Each work here is created by a different altar in Noble's system some being as young as 12 and some being male. My personal favorite is the one with the multiple figures called Robot Family by an alter named Bonnie. Kim Noble actually made an appearance on Oprah in around 2012, I believe. That ended up being pivotal to my research. Here she talked about life with dissociative identity disorder, but also how it impacted her art. 
An interesting type of mental disease I found was frontal temporal dementia, a form of dementia that causes language deterioration over time. This type of dementia manifests quite young at around 45 to 60 and typically starts with sudden creative outbursts. This happens because once the language pathway in the brain is closed, other pathways have the opportunity to open, most often creativity. People with jobs like bankers and accountants who had never shown a creative inkling in their life suddenly started to create elaborate pieces with little to no training. The image you see here is of what areas of the brain are affected by frontal temporal, the frontal and temporal lobes. And the bottom one is of a normal brain scan and then a brain slice of someone with The most famous of the frontal temporal cases is Anne Adams, a former biologist who suddenly quit her job and turned to painting full time. While she is most famous for her piece Unraveling Bolero, she also created this piece here titled Migraine. Adams died in 2007 from her dementia, but before her death, she had lost almost all ability to speak. In a UCLA study, Adams was asked to describe a picture of children playing in a park, and the only word she could say was kite. One of my best sources actually ended up being a podcast on Unraveling Bolero, and it's History by Radiolab. It talked about the origins of the piece and the interesting connection between Adams, who created Unraveling Bolero, and Maurice Ravel, who had frontal temporal dementia nearly 80 years earlier. Ravel made the composition Bolero, a song consisting of one melody repeating over and over for 15 minutes. Unraveling Bolero is actually code for the song, with each symbol and color representing a different note and bar in the composition. The other source I considered to be the most useful was a journal on the relationship between creativity and psychopathology, the scientific study of mental disorders. And just to give you all a sense of the repetition that Bolero had, I have Bolero. I created an annotated bibliography, and while being helpful for organizing my thoughts, I found the format immensely frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could say that I understood why it needed to be formatted like this, or even what I did wrong when I submitted my annotated bibliography, but the whole point of this presentation is honesty and self-reflection. <laughs> in my research, even though there was a lot to sort through and I needed to learn different terms. My annotated bibliography kept me organized and was a great source for me to look back to to create the informational aspects of this presentation. I will admit, I could have spent some more time on art therapy and art and healing, but I still think I've made some pretty good research. If I could change anything I did, I would try not to get so frustrated with my annotated bibliography <laughs> and be a little kinder to myself about it. I was very kind to myself, however, in the product section of the process due to the sheer excitement I had about what I created. I knew for my product I wanted to do something that was interactive and that people could actually see in front of them instead of something digital like a podcast. Things like that hold my attention better, so I assumed they would also hold my audiences as well. I wanted to have fun creating my product, but I also wanted to be challenged. 
Given the nature of my project, it would have been a missed opportunity not to include art, so I knew that was a requirement. I also wanted something that would build skills of mine and explore potential new interests. Because of this, when Ms. Birnbach set me up with one of her friends who would let me use his mentally ill mother's work to curate an art show, I knew that was what I wanted to do. It perfectly captured the question, what is the relationship between art and insanity? Before I actually started setting up, I did some research into art curation and what makes a good exhibit. I found that order was crucial to a good exhibit and that I needed to display anchor pieces to naturally draw the viewer to the space. I needed to pick a space with good accent areas, which are just walls that don't clash with the different palettes and figures of the piece. It was also important to ensure balance between the pieces, making sure things were aesthetically pleasing and each wall had something to look at to control traffic flow, make sure that people weren't just stuck on one wall. For the wall text, I needed to be concise but still effective in what I was trying to say. This piece here is an untitled work by Eloise Corbaz, who also has schizophrenia. So what did I consider when creating wall text? First, I wanted to establish a link to the mental illness I thought was being represented in each piece. The artist had schizophrenia and dissociative identity disorder, so depending on the piece and what I felt fit more, I would either link it to one, the other, or both in some cases. I then looked at the color palettes represented throughout the pieces and what I thought they meant to the artist. There's a difference between cool blues and purples and warm pinks and oranges, and I wanted to explore that. I also considered the shapes involved in the pieces. Were they organic and flowing from the page, or sharp and harsh to the viewer? Similarly, I looked at the expressions and whether the figures were, were represented, shown as soft and welcoming, or harsh and cool. Finally, I looked at the facts of the artist's life and connected it to the different pieces. Finding a home for all these pieces that balance them out correctly, however, proved quite difficult. I bounced around the dance studio, the gallery, and this very room before finding, finally landing on the stairwell. After, I then need to think about how many pieces I could fit into the stairwell and sort through around 150 pieces to find which ones suit the, the portfolio best. After I had my set pieces, I created a slideshow to submit for the product deadline because I didn't want to put up my exhibit a month in advance for fear of damage. The slideshow featured all the pieces I planned on talking about and the things I was going to say about them, specifically notes from the series and the wall text requirements that I mentioned before. While some pieces have in-depth analysis and I had a lot to say about them, others just included the basic facts of the piece. I wanted to make sure the space captured the energy I wanted it to portray, so I made a playlist that I thought would put the viewer's head in the right mindset while viewing. The vibe I wanted was mostly slower songs with, me with many acoustics and minimal background vocals so that the viewer could form a deeper connection with the artist and feel very one-on-one. -on -one. Some of these songs were a bit creepy, so I apologize for that, but I felt like they fit very well with what I wanted to do. After all that, I finally got into the stairwell and put up a spike tape to mark where all the pieces would be, as you can see in this image. I took a lot of time in moving things around to get the perfect order that I thought would best suit the entire portfolio. After all this preparation, I finally put up my wall text and my chosen pieces, and it was so satisfying. I wanted to give you all an example of how I would choose to analyze a piece. So here we have the Fairy Feller's Master Stroke by Richard Dodd. This piece was made in a psych ward after he murdered his father in a schizophrenic episode. And I was first drawn to the color palette when looking at it. The viewer is immediately met with very muted colors and little light areas to balance it out. With the reeds in the foreground, we see very chaotic and jagged shapes creating a sense of unease in the viewer. Finally, the chaos of this piece and the lack of negative space suggests that the state of Dodd's mind while creating it was very busy and erratic, mm -hmm. something that's backed up by the facts of the piece. As Ms. Birnbach mentioned, I'm now going to take the panel to
to my product for them to see it more personally, and you all are going to watch a video on schizophrenia and dissociative identity disorder. <laughs> Schizophrenia is a chronic condition that usually surfaces for men in their early to mid-twenties and for women in their late twenties. For some, the disorder comes on gradually, but for others it can arise more suddenly, perhaps triggered by stress or trauma, although no event can actually cause the disorder. Once thought of as a single discrete condition, schizophrenia is now included in the DSM-5 as a point on a spectrum of disorders that vary in how they're expressed and how long they last. But they share similar symptoms. Schizophrenia spectrum disorders are currently thought of as characterized by disorganized thinking, emotions, and behaviors that are often incongruent with their situations, and disturbed perceptions, including delusions and hallucinations. They all involve a kind of loss of contact with reality on some level. The resulting behaviors and mental states associated with this break from reality are generally called psychotic symptoms, and they usually impair the ability to function. When someone's experiencing psychotic symptoms, their thinking and speech can become disorganized, rambling and fragmented. This tendency to pick up one train of thought and suddenly switch to another and then another can make communication painfully difficult. People exhibiting these symptoms can also suffer a breakdown in selective attention, losing the ability to focus on one thing while filtering others out. In extreme cases, speech may become so fragmented it becomes little more than a string of meaningless words, a condition given a name that sounds like its own kind of non sequitur, word salad. Classic schizophrenia is also often marked by delusions or false beliefs not based in reality. These delusions can be rooted in ideas of grandeur, like I'm the Queen of England, or I won an Olympic gold medal for the luge. Or they can become narratives of persecution and paranoia, believing your thoughts and actions are being controlled by an outside force, or that you're being spied on or followed, or that you're on the verge of a major catastrophe. And there are some complicated variations on these delusions, like feeling that you've died or don't exist anymore, or that someone is madly in love with you, or that you're infested with parasites. Delusions of one kind or another strike as many as four out of five people with schizophrenia. While some delusions can seem fairly logical, they can also be severe and bizarre and frightening. Unfortunately, many of the most memorable examples of people suffering from severe delusions come from serial killers, and yeah, while the son of Sam did claim that he was taking orders from his neighbor's dog, that kind of stuff is in the tiny, tiny, tiny minority. Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys and Sid Barrett of Pink Floyd have both suffered psychotic symptoms. And then, of course, there's John Nash, the Nobel Prize-winning American mathematician and subject of the movie A Beautiful Mind. Through proper treatment, some people with schizophrenia have not only learned to live with their illness, but also made fantastic creative contributions to the world. Many people with schizophrenia also suffer from perceptual disturbances or sensory experiences that come without any apparent sensory stimulation, like hallucinations. This is when a person sees or hears something that isn't there, often lacking the ability to understand what is real and what isn't. Auditory hallucinations or hearing voices are the most common form, and these voices are often abusive. It's as if your inner monologue, that little conversation that you have with yourself or the random things that float through your head, were somehow coming from outside of you. It's as if you couldn't sort out whether the voices in your mind were internal and self-generated or external and other-generated. To me, it sounds terrifying. Other common symptoms include disorganized, abnormal, or incongruent behavior and emotions. This could mean laughing when recalling a loved one's death or crying while others are laughing, acting like a goofy child one minute then becoming unpredictably angry or agitated the next. Movements may become inappropriate and compulsive, like continually rocking back and forth or remaining motionless for hours. Broadly, most psychotic symptoms fall into three general categories traditionally used by psychologists. Positive, negative, and disorganized symptoms. Positive symptoms are not what they sound like. They're the type that add something to the experience of the patient, like, for example, hallucinations, or inappropriate laughter, or tears, or delusional thoughts. Negative symptoms refer to those that subtract from normal behavior, like a reduced ability to function, neglect of personal hygiene, lack of emotion, toneless voice, expressionless face, or withdrawal from family and friends. Finally, disorganized symptoms are those jumbles of thought or speech that could include word salad and other problems with attention and organization. Symptoms like these are are useful in diagnosing a disorder on the schizophrenia spectrum, but there's a physiological component too. Like many of the disorders we've talked about, schizophrenia has been associated with a number of brain abnormalities. Postmortem research on schizophrenia patients has found that many have extra receptors for dopamine, a neurotransmitter involved in emotion regulation at the brain's pleasure and reward centers. Some researchers think that overly responsive dopamine systems might magnify brain activity in some way, perhaps creating hallucinations and other so-called positive symptoms as the brain 
brain loses its capacity to tell the difference between internal and external stimuli. For this reason, dopamine blocking drugs are often used as antipsychotic medications in treatment. Modern neuroimaging studies also show that some people with schizophrenia have abnormal brain activity in several different parts of the brain. One study noted that when patients were hallucinating, for example, there was unusually high activity in the thalamus, which is involved in filtering incoming sensory signals. Another study noted that patients with paranoid symptoms showed overactivity in the fear processing amygdala. So schizophrenia it seems to involve not just problems with one part of the brain, but abnormalities in several areas and their interconnections. But what might be causing these abnormalities? Earlier I mentioned how a stressful event might trigger psychotic symptoms for the first time, even though it can't actually create the disorder. Psychologists call this the diathesis stress model. This way of thinking involves a combination of biological and genetic vulnerabilities, diathesis, and environmental stressors, stress, that both contribute to the onset of schizophrenia. This model helps explain why some people with genetic vulnerability might not always develop schizophrenia, and why the rates of schizophrenia tend to be higher with some degree of poverty or socioeconomic <coughs> stress. And it seems clear that there is some kind of genetic predisposition for the disorder. The 1 in 100 odds of developing schizophrenia jump to nearly 1 in 10 if you have a parent or sibling with the disorder, with about 50-50 odds if that sibling is an identical twin, even if those twins were raised apart. One recent landmark seven-year study looked at genetic samples across 35 countries, examining more than 35,000 people with schizophrenia and another 110,000 people without the disorder. The study identified more than 100 genes that may increase the risk of schizophrenia. As expected, some of these genes involve dopamine regulation, but others are related to immune system functioning. Researchers continue to tease out what is exactly going on here, but many are hopeful that these new findings will lead to better treatment. Clearly, schizophrenia is a challenging disorder to live with and one that's hard for outsiders to understand, but maybe even more rare and more elusive are the dissociative disorders. These are disorders of consciousness, called dissociative because they're marked by an interruption in conscious awareness. Patients can become separated from the thoughts or feelings that they used to have, which can result in a sudden loss of memory or even change in identity. Now, we might all experience minor dissociation at times, like maybe the sense that you're watching yourself from above, as in a movie, or like you're driving home and get so zoned out that suddenly you find yourself in front of Taco Bell thinking, like, how did I get here? Those things would generally fall into the normal range of dissociation, but most of us don't develop different personalities. Dissociative disorders come in several different forms, but the most infamous of the bunch is probably dissociative identity disorder. This has long been known as multiple personality disorder, and yes, it is a thing. It's a rare and flashy disorder in which a person exhibits two or more distinct and alternating identities, and the best known case was that of Shirley Mason, whose story was famously rendered in the 1973 bestseller Sybil, and later in a popular miniseries. The book was marketed as the true story of a woman who suffered great childhood trauma and ended up with 16 different personalities, ranging from Vicky, a self-assured French woman, to handyman Sid, to the religious and critical Clara. The book became a craze, and within a few years, reported cases of multiple personalities skyrocketed from scarcely 100 to nearly 40,000. Many believe the book was essentially responsible for creating a new psychiatric diagnosis. It turns out, though, Sybil's story was a big, fat lie. Yes, Shirley Mason was a real person, and one with a troubled, traumatic past and a number of psychological issues. As a student in New York in the 1950s, she started seeing a therapist named Connie Wilbur and taking some heavy medications. Somewhere in there, maybe because she was coaxed, or maybe because she wanted more attention, Shirley started expressing different personalities. Dr. Wilbur built a career and a book deal out of her star patient, even after Shirley confessed that her split personality was a ruse. The simple case is a powerful reminder that we really don't understand dissociative disorders very well, or even know if they're always real. Indeed, some people question if dissociative identity disorder is an actual disorder at all. But some studies have shown distinct body and brain states that seem to appear in different identities things like one personality being right-handed while the other is left-handed, or different personalities having variations in their eyesight that ophthalmologists could actually detect. In these cases, dissociations of identity may be in response to stress or anxiety, a sort of extreme coping mechanism. Either way, the debate and the research continue. Today, we talk... So these are a few pieces that the panel just saw in my exhibit that I just wanted to highlight in case you hadn't seen them on the way in. I don't have a picture of the full exhibit because I created it to be viewed in person and I really don't think a picture would have done it justice. So please, take a look once this is over. To 
prepare for this presentation, I first outlined everything I wanted to talk about because personally, I work better when I have a clear plan in front of me. Once I had that done, I went to Slides Go, to choose a template, and made my entire presentation and was done with it. But of course, I just decided that I didn't like that template anymore, so I scrapped the entire thing and made this one. After all that, all I had left to do was practice. My poor parents and friends have probably listened to this presentation for what feels like a hundred times, but practicing was very important to me and they knew that. I wanted this to be very smooth and well rehearsed. <coughs> Finally, I worked out all my technology issues, I thought, <laughs> in this room before coming here today to present this to you all. This piece you see here is another by one of Kim Noble's altars titled Lost in Play. The altar is named Ken and is a gay man in his early 20s. This part of my senior exhibition is where I thought I shone the most. I learned new skills and explored curation, something that I'm shockingly really interested in. I was also really proud of myself for keeping a consistent work ethic no matter what I was feeling. This was my favorite part of my exhibition by far. Finally, we've made it to the conclusion. I developed a lot of skills over the years but I really worked on my procrastination and being able to do things when I get them for the best results. I also worked on consistency by putting in equal amounts of effort whether, I'm not, whether I was feeling up to it or not. As those of you who know me know, I struggle with putting in 100% when I'm really not into something, and that's something I worked on a lot, which I'm really proud of myself for. I also worked on my organizational skills, specifically my note-taking and my annotated bibliography. Finally, I polished my communication skills and worked on responding to things in a timely manner and keeping connections. Here in the middle, um, I have a poem by a schizophrenic poet named Charles Bukowski titled, I Can't Stay in the Same Room Without a Woman for Five Minutes. It reads, can't, can't you make him stop? I asked the barkeep, can't you shut that thing off? What's the matter with you, buddy, he asked. I submit my poems to the magazines, I said. You submit your poems to the magazines, he asked. You are goddamn right I do, I said. I finished my drink and got back to the car. I drove down Pico Boulevard. The remainder of the day was bound to be better. This was a very fun project, and it came with a lot of highlights. I found new passions of mine, for example, curation, like I just talked about. And I realized that I might want to explore that professionally, which I never would have considered before this. I had the perfect balance of being intrigued, but also challenged, which helped me get through the year. And finally, I finished strong. And as my mentor says, it's not about how you start something, it's about how you finish it. So, did I answer my question? The answer that everyone loves, yes and no. <laughs> as we saw in this presentation, I found actual links in psychology to creativity and mental illness, specifically in schizophrenia and those positive symptoms I talked about, like hallucinations. I also gave you real life examples in all the art that I included throughout my presentation, like Halloween's Corbaz, Richard Dodd, um, August Satter. But there's still a lot more to find on this topic in the psychological field. So I'm kind of, in, I'm kind of intrigued by the fact that I'm still gonna be thinking about this even when this presentation is over because there's so much more to find out. If I had to give advice to anyone who will do this project in the future, I would say make your life easier and start early. You're going to have college applications and sports and activities and everything in between. And you really don't want to put senior sound on top of that. Experiential learning is crucial to what makes this whole process fun. And while I was able to salvage my exhibition, there's a chance you might not be able to. So don't take it for granted. Use your seniors on an art block for actual work, not just talking with your friends, no matter how tempting that may be. <laughs> and finally, choose a topic you know you can stick with. Otherwise, you'll be changing a third throughout the year and scrambling to get back on track. <laughs> this is a really amazing opportunity, so make the most of it. This is other work by Yoik Sama. Finally, I would like to thank Ms. Birnbach for all her mentoring, <coughs> Oscar for helping me lug over those heavy curtains you saw over there, 
Ms. Donovan for all her support in my endeavors, Ms. Henze for trusting the process with me, and you all for being here today to support me. Thank you so much. Did it occur to you that even though you said you didn't want to write a research paper, that you essentially did all the work to write a research paper about this? Well, that's a really great point. <laughs> I think I mostly just didn't want to like sit down, get in front of the computer, type for how many hours to make something. This was just a lot more fun to actually do, and it kept me occupied for a really long time. And you said the bibliography not was thing. Yeah. <laughs> Don't even talk to me about that. <laughs> right, well, Don't talk to me about I, it. So anyway, the, the, I, have, I have lots of questions about the installation, about the exhibit. Um, so in dealing with, I've, I've Can always- Can back to the slide with some of the art? Yeah, yeah of course. Thank you so much. So I think, yeah. I'll phrase this way. There we go. Thank you. So, how would how would this how would the reception of this exhibit be different without the wall text? Yeah. So I think when so someone is viewing art and doesn't read wall text, it's very much more up to interpretation. With the wall text, I'm giving you what I think of it, so our brains are automatically tuned to go, oh yeah, that's true, once you are like see it in front of you. Can you give an example using one of those for the whole group, like what you would say about them? Yeah, so, um, which one did I do something on? Um, let's talk about this one, sure. So, for this one, um, it was in a series that I have on the top right wall, so if you saw it, um, and I would talk about how the black figure in the middle has very sharp and jagged edges within it, like all the lines you see, but it's also not completely there, also like a cloud kind of, a little dark jagged cloud. <laughs> and then we have the red spots, which reminded me personally of blood, but also what I wanted to talk about the most with this piece was the negative space you see. There's a lot of leg space, and for me I took that as being representative of the mind and kind of mental illness in general as a sort of infection to this one piece of paper. That's a fascinating interpretation. Uh, it's a it's a you know useful uh, description of the sort of composition of the piece. Yeah. I was asking more about what happens if a viewer or a patron of this ex exhibit goes in there and has no idea that these were the works of an artist experiencing mental illness. Like that production context matters a lot yeah. for the entire, for, for the reception of these works of art. So does that, what effects would that have? Does that take away from the viewer's full understanding of the works that they're seeing or observing? Does it offer a different, but no less valid or valuable potential interpretation of these works? Yeah. Is it worthwhile to have sort of like a naive or ignorant of the context appraisal of these, not appraisal, uh, sort of critical reception of these works first before knowing the production history. As a curator, how do you manage, not as curator, <laughs> as a curator, how do you create or curate the, the sequence of sort of uh, revelations of more and more context for these pieces and how does that series of interpretations from naive to slightly more informed to most informed uh, affect what what goes into the process of creation. Like where does one decide to land? Yeah. You give the audience all the information right away? Do you allow them a naive interpretation first and then give them more information? Or yeah. So I kind of created this knowing that most people were not gonna read everything that I wrote, right? 
So Welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> So, but there is enough context to kind of link it back to my exhibition. I think that's really what I was concerned about, like linking it back to my exhibition. What is the relationship between art and insanity? And I think I did that pretty well. Um, if you read the wall text, I don't know how many of you did, but um, I think it's worth reading. It's kind of like what I spent the most time on. Thank you very much. I think, I think you did do it well. And my, my annoying questions are sort of like, if there were no title to this exhibition, yeah. if, there, if the, the viewer walked in not knowing that this was an exhibit about the connection between art and mental illness, how would that reception play out? Sort of but I mean, when was the last time I think you went to a museum that had an exhibit, an, an exhibit with no title? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and there's always some sort of framing of expectations beforehand. So thank you very much. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so I know you said that you ended up not being very interested in your first topic and that you kind of fell into this new topic after realizing your enjoyment of art and the like. Um, and I just have a question, if now after you've been researching it for so many months, do you think that you have more of an interest in your life or, I don't know, possibly career for the psychology behind this type of art and or the formation and products of mental illness? Yeah, um, for the psychology part, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of taking Psych 101 in college terrifies me. It does. Um, I know that some people have really big interest in psychology, and that's great. I'm really happy for you all, <laughs> but I'm not one of those people. So, no, I don't think I'm interested in the psychological aspects of it. But definitely the expression part. I am very interested in the expression of mental illness, like I mentioned before. So, yeah, kind of taking that and looking more at, like, the art that's created instead of, like, the terms and the different areas of the brain and all that. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, the, the thing that comes to mind when we're talking about whether you're going to be affected in the future. Um, in the late 60s, uh, Timothy Leary and, uh, and Baba Ramdas and Alan Watts um, were three professors at Harvard and were kicked out because of their experiments with uh, LSD because they were asking the deeper questions. They were asking what is the nature of reality, whatever, and which, which uh, leads to the psychology of it. It was also a, a whole push of uh, communicating with dolphins, learning the language. So you know, once you get onto this, you know, it, it can get pretty interesting yeah. to not want to run from Psychology 101. I realize it can be pretty dry when you first start the introductions, but it can be, uh, it can be pretty exciting the, the way that you for instance, um, uh, the thing that comes from my orientation is, is drums and nonverbal communication and how much more meaningful nonverbal is than verbal, than verbal much of the time. So I, I, I would hope that this would be a, a catalyst for you to not run in the other direction. Certainly it's coming out of you and, and, and the artists uh, and, and all of these uh, expressions of art, um, I think it made your life pretty interesting right now, because yeah. I, I think this whole process probably is a great phrase uh, my mother used to say to me, the jewel is not polished without friction. <laughs> so just the fact that you had the rise to do this and got involved, I hope that in, you know when the uh, smoke clears that you end up going in that way because you, your communication skills are really good and you know, and we can feel uh, how much of an effort you're making, and you keep good eye contact, your body language is good, you know, all of that stuff. All of the important stuff, so. Thank you, and well, I will definitely keep that in mind. Yeah. Either are you um, available for a couple questions from the group? Of course. You pick or do I pick? You pick. Oh. Okay. So first, you might not know the answer to this, but in relation to uh, dopamine and schizophrenia, it's prevalent 
uh, increase, does that mean that for it, like, it doesn't really end up having, uh, at the same time, other disorders which have reduced dopamine? Or you have no idea, but that's also not exactly directly, uh, just that came up in this part. Yeah, so definitely an interesting question. <laughs> but um, I didn't do, I guess, in-depth research into that specific aspect of this topic. Um, however, I know that there are people with schizophrenia and depression, schizophrenia and severe anxiety. So it does exist. Like, other people you? What's your take on, like, is there a general trend among these artists? Like, what's the purpose of their art? Especially those that, like, suddenly came into being an artist as their disease developed. Like, is this like, oh my gosh, I have to let the world know what I'm seeing, this is what's going on in my head? Or is it like, hey, I want to do a still life of a, you know, a picture with some apples and this is what it looks like when my brain connects to my hand? Yeah. Or, you know, you know is, it, is it an outlet for what's troubling them inside? Is it just their take on, what, what do you think? I think it's the former. Um, like an outlet for what's troubling people. However, I know in August Natter's case, he was trying to warn people of Armageddon by drawing it. He thought that he had the gift of prophecy, okay. what have you. <laughs> so yeah, it, there's definitely aspects of it like that. Um, trends within the art, I know you mentioned that earlier in the question. Um, I noticed a lot that artists with schizophrenia tend to have trouble drawing eyes. So like as we saw with Natter's piece, the eyes looked slightly off, like they weren't necessarily perfect human eyes. And like a lot of pieces such as Eloise Corpaz, I'll go back to her, I don't know. This is a Corpaz piece. You can see the eyes are just blue semicircles. So, um, and then Natter's work, especially raw vision, eyes are just white circles. <coughs> so that's the time that I have. Uh, Caroline. For choosing your topic, did you, like for this topic, the, the, like the second one, um, <laughs> did, did you choose it because you have like past experience with it? Have you researched it before? Like how did this topic specifically, because I find it to be a very specific topic that I wouldn't even think of. How did you find it? Yeah, so um, after I had switched my essential question, I didn't really know what I was going to do yet, but I knew I wanted to do something that was a lot more interactive and hands-on. Um, I tossed around a few ideas, and originally I wanted to look at um, what does it take to run your own ceramics business, because that's like looking at art. Um, and then I took that, and I realized that I kind of wanted to do a little bit more research. Like that was mostly podcasts, it was mostly interviews. So I wanted to be able to do some more research in my field. And then I was tossing around ideas with Ms. Birnbach a bit and we just landed on this question. So. Okay, just a few more questions or comments. Robbie. So uh, you mentioned that like a big focus was on DID yeah. and uh, a lot of the research you did with that. And then you, when you left and you played the Hank Green video, he mentioned that there's like a lot of contention about like the reality of it. Yeah. Or whether maybe it's linked to like other, maybe that illness isn't real, it's like a symptom of other illnesses as we have heard. What are your thoughts on that after doing so much research on the topic? Yeah, yeah good question. Um, I think dissociative identity disorder is real. Um, I think that the brain learns how to cope, especially at such a young age. So developing multiple personalities due to extreme trauma, it makes sense. At the end of the video, Hank Green mentioned that certain alters are left or right-handed while the host would be the other. And that um, there's even differences in eyesight. So certain alters might need glasses. That was mentioned at the end of the video. So yeah, I think it's real. There's evidence to back it up. More questions? Yeah, I came up with another one. Um, unfortunately, I do not know much about DID. I yeah. have never studied it the way that you have for this project. Um, do you know, in the form of an artist with DID, would they 
remember, like, would they know their other personalities if they yeah. saw other artwork? Like, one day if they had one personality that was dominant and another day they had a different personality that was dominant and they were actively working on a painting, would they kind of know what was happening? Mm. Yeah, good question. Um, there are some cases where people don't know they have dissociative identity disorder. Um, in the early stages of the mental disorder, um, people experience like gaps in time where they don't know what's happening. Like they will be in their kitchen and suddenly they're in the grocery store and they're like, how did I get here? What happened? It's only after people go to therapy and start to kind of like talk through it and kind of coax that the therapist sees like a switch in personality and knows that that's like the DID. Mm -hmm. So that's typically when it's found. However, what you brought up was a really good point. Like, I don't, I think if someone didn't know they had dissociative identity disorder, or was making a painting, and suddenly there was a time blank, and it was a completely different painting, be pretty scared, like, mm. who did this? Mm -hmm. But yeah, I've never heard of anyone discovering they had dissociative identity disorder through that. It's mostly through mm -hmm. therapy practices. So all of those artists knew their other personalities? Yeah, yeah. So what I mentioned that Kim Noble went on Oprah, um, on Oprah, she actually interviewed um, Kim, this alter named Patricia, a few more. Um, There's like five in the whole interview, I believe. So, yeah. All right, so one last, let's do one last pick. <laughs> um, during your research for this topic, did you end up finding a specific art piece or artist that you found to your favorite, or that you kind of connected with, almost? Connected with? I don't know. <laughs> but um, I think I'd be a little bit concerned with myself if I had connected. <laughs> but um, favorite? Yes. Migraine by Ann Adams. I think it's super cool. I know, as I mentioned, Unraveling Bolero is her most famous piece. Like, that's the one that people think of when they know her. But this one I found, I think it's super cool. All the abstraction, but still, like, having this um, cohesive pattern, I'm really interested in, and I found it really exciting. Um, but also, I forgot what I was going to say, so yeah. <laughs> There is no but also. All right, there are definitely a lot of questions still in the room. So what's going to happen is that we're going to congratulate Nina, and then we are going to do something di different from what you all are going to do. If you want to stay and ask Nina questions, you are more than welcome to. Okay. Um, but Nina, fantastic job. Thank, Thank you so much. <laughs>
Thank you. Okay. 